Welcome to Uriah Heap, the Magician's Podcast. I'll be covering every studio song the band has recorded and every bonus track that I can find. Each week we'll go over a new song from the beginning to where they are currently, and as they keep adding albums, I'll keep adding shows. Let the deep dive party begin. In the magic garden, some were singing, some were dancing. Hello and welcome to another episode of Uriah Heap, the Magician's Podcast. I am your host, Scott Haskin, here with another song. We are at song number 10 on the new CD album, cassette, whatever format you've got it on, a digital download, Chaos and Color, the 25th studio album from the mighty Uriah Heap. Uh, man, this this has been such an incredible journey through this album. Uh, really excited to get to this song. This is the longest song on the album, coming in at 8 minutes and 11 seconds. It is called Freedom to be Free. We're going to get to that in just a moment. Uh, this one was written by Mick and Phil, as is the final song on the album. But before we get to that, guys, it's Monday. I hope you had a fantastic weekend. Uh, you know, I spent the weekend recording podcasts and, uh, and doing some other stuff, but mostly recording podcasts. I uh, had a great time, too. Uh, I want to let you guys know there are still some copies left of the Everyday Rocks box set. The XXXL uh, size, I believe, is uh, is sold out. But there are still a few units of the other sizes available, as well as the Choices box set. You can get that both at Uriah-Heap.com, where Dave White has organized the wonderful website for the band. And he also manages Mick-Box.net. Another wonderful website to go and dig into. Lots and lots of pages, lots of stuff. Uh, Dave does such a great job with that. Go check out those box sets, guys. Uh, They're great. Now, of course, BMG has expanded beyond the Everyday Rocks box set. They have released some of those picture discs from there as single picture discs that you can purchase on the same website. Uh, But they have also gone beyond and uh, done one for Return to Fantasy. And that is now available. Those just came out January 20th. Uh, Sweet Freedom and Return to Fantasy are brand new additions to the uh, individual picture discs that you can purchase. I can tell you guys, honestly, I have the Everyday Rocks box set and they are such great quality, uh, really thick, beautiful graphics. Um, I mean, you could probably throw them across the room, but don't do that. And they would be fine. Again, don't do that. I'm not recommending any destruction of your eye heat property. Now, the Choices box set is really cool, too. That is uh, only in CD format and were uh, basically six different CDs from band members past and present. Their personal choices for their picks for what you should listen to if you're just getting into your Heap. So for those people that that you tell, hey, you should check out this amazing Uriah Heap podcast and they go, Uriah Heap, like what songs would you recommend that I check out if I want to get into Uriah Heap? You send them right to that Everyday Rocks box set. Or I'm sorry, he had Choices box set. And uh, those are the suggestions from the band. Uh, a, a, a very great list. You can't go wrong. I mean, pretty much anything you pick is going to be a great pick. But they, there have been so many um, variations. You know, during the 80s, they sounded a certain way. In the 90s, then all of a sudden, they're this like really heavy band. Uh, in, in the 70s, they were, uh, you know, so uh, so different from what we're hearing now. So it's, I don't even know how to explain it in the moment. So uh, lots of great stuff to go and check out. And of course, uh, Chaos and Colors, you can get that if you don't have it already. What's wrong with you? Now, before we start the show, of course, I want to uh, take a moment because it's Monday to thank a couple of people. We're going to start the week right with some gratitude. I want to thank uh, Cakewalk by BandLab. I just had uh, some interactions with them recently. Absolutely wonderful people. Their customer service has been top notch ever since they took it over from Gibson. Uh, I have to say BandLab has been a, a fantastic company. They've been on top of all the updates. And you know what? They give it to us for free. There is no charge for Cakewalk by BandLab. I've been with Cakewalk since it was owned by 12 Cone Systems like 30 years ago. My God, I'm old. So uh, they have been absolutely fantastic. It's probably more like 20. But they have been uh, absolutely fantastic taking that over. And like I said, it is absolutely free. Digital Audio Workstation does pretty much everything Pro Tools can do. Just comes with a different set of plugins. Some plugins are made specifically for Pro Tools, uh, and that's fine. Honestly, everything that's made for Pro Tools, you can find other versions of elsewhere. Uh, But uh, it doesn't cost you like $600 a year to be a part of it either. Uh, Not a fan of Pro Tools. Uh, 
Uh, also, I want to thank Podbean, who is the current distributor of the podcast. They're the ones that send it out to Spotify and all the uh, different places, uh, Apple Podcasts, uh, Amazon, all the places that you can hear it. And uh, Stitcher Radio is another one. You might be listening on Stitcher. I find that most listeners of this show statistically are listening through Apple Podcasts, which is very interesting. Uh, I like Apple Podcasts. I don't like their app as much as I like the Stitcher app or the Podbean app. But um, but hey, if if you're used to it, then it's easy to navigate. I just find it a little awkward uh, to find everything that I needed to find. You know, if I like haven't listened to a podcast in a while, like which episodes did I listen to and which ones I didn't. Um, I don't I don't like the filters as much as I do for some of the other ones. But you know what? Hey, if it's working for people, it's working. And that's all that matters. My graphic artist who did the logos for the show, Scott Lazinski, known him since the end of 10th grade of high school. So like 700 and some years, uh, absolutely great guy. He also did the book covers for uh, my third What Happened in Vegas book and all three of the books in my Universal Court trilogy. Very talented graphic artist. Uh, go check him out. Audionamics, you guys know I will not do a podcast without Audionamics and their instant dialogue cleaner, even though I did have to do a couple without it. And uh, although I was happy with the results, I wasn't really happy with the results. So they are my number one go-to for dialogue cleaning. I live right next to a freaking airport, uh, an international, very busy airport at that. And, uh, you know, if you guys have ever heard a plane on this show, let me know. I'd be curious because I think I've gotten them all with the instant dialogue cleaner. And all I do, set it, turn a knob, boom, done. Uh, Isotope, I also use their declicker waves. I use their vocal rider, sibilance and deep breath. And Sonatus, I use the compressor. That is a uh, an old school cakewalk only plugin. Um, yeah, it's a really nice one too. Very easy to use. Uh, also want to shout out to Dave White, who shares the show with everybody. He is the director of social media. And as I said, he runs Mix and the band's official website. Um, God, the, the forest of pages that he has created for this band has absolutely been incredible. Um, also just want to thank all of you guys who have shared the show, who have helped out, um, with information and, uh, you know, reviews, ratings, all that stuff, uh, really does make a difference. So thank you guys all very much for, for doing that. There are some great groups, some great, um, people that are always, uh, talking about Uriah Heep, talking about the new album, especially, uh, sharing pictures of the recent concerts from, uh, you know, the festivals and stuff that they would played since, uh, the lockdown is restrictions have been lifted and all that. I'm um, hoping they get over here to the United States before too much longer. Time will tell. Uh, and last but not least, of course, I've got to thank my brothers and sister in the Deep Dive Podcast Network, Terry T-Bone Mathley, Nate and John at the Deep Purple Podcast, The Simple Man, Rye at Sabbath Bloody Podcast, Paul, Joe, and David, who do In the Lap of the Pods, Andy and Mac at, Matt at Hawk Binge, Eric and Jonathan at Maiden A to Z Pod, Daniel and Joss, who do an incredible Aussie podcast, Ben and Sam, who do a Red Hot, Red Hot Chili Peppers podcast, George and Hattie at the Judas Priest cast, Mark and Corey Morissette, well, Mark Kameyer and Corey Morissette do And the Podcast Will Rock All Things Van Halen. Corey is uh, also does another show with uh, John Mariano, Backtracks theme music, talking about um, music in movies. A very interesting show. I've been a guest on that. I've also been a guest on And the Podcast Will Rock. And of course, uh, John and Corey and myself do another show called Backtracks Aerosmith Revisited, going through the entire Aerosmith catalog to make the ultimate, well, it was going to be mixed tape. And now we're on mixed tapes because uh, there's just too much to cover and, and narrow down to like 18 songs. This is not possible. Uh, and then uh, Clay and Riot, North by South, Jonathan and Greg at So Far, So Pod, So What, All About Megadeth. Kevin at the Tom Petty Project. Kevin also does another show with Randy, the Seaside Pod Review, another Queen show. Quinn at And Volume for All. And of course, Sav, Nick, John, and Mark at the Rock Roulette Podcast. Then there's my buddy Brandon, who does Metallicast, my favorite Metallica podcast. It's also the only one I listen to, but I have listened to other ones. So it's still fair to call it my favorite without cheating because it's the only one that I listen to. And of course, check out gottahearemall.com, gottahearemall.com uh, for the touring histories of bands like Deep Purple, Emerson, Lake, and Palmer, all kinds of fun, cool tidbits there. Uh, great stuff if you want to check that out. And then, of course, the podcast of the band's manager, Ace himself, Louder with Ace, which you can get on Stitcher and YouTube. Uh, great show. Recently, he's uh, come back with a couple episodes talking about a music and film. So there you go. Another very popular theme. Then, of course, uh, you know, check out the band on Cameo. I've got all the links on my website. I have a page for the podcast there, scotthaskin.com, 
S-C-O-T-T-H-A-S-K-I-N.com. Click the Uriah Heat podcast link. There's links to, uh, you know, projects that the individual members have done, all the interviews, every single show. And then uh, the band's websites, the official stores, because there's more than one. There's two, uh, which would be more than one. Um, Elkie's photo, uh, all kinds of, of great stuff, but links to their cameos and uh, and stuff too. So go check all that stuff out on the website. Um, hope hope it's well organized. I mean, everything's mainly on the one page. You can also find the links to all the folks that I just mentioned, um, all the shows and, and folks in the Deep Dive Podcast Network are all on that page as well. Uh, if you would like to make a donation to the show, you can do that. Uh, the link is also at the bottom of the website. So all pretty simple stuff. Uh, go check it out. But in the meantime, it is time that we get into today's song. It is a bit longer. Like I said, it is a uh, a song that lasts eight minutes and 11 seconds. It was written by Mick Box and Phil Lanzon. It is called Freedom to Be Free. You know, I hate to say things like that really sounds like Uriah Heep because that could mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people, right? Like if your first album was Live in the Dream versus your first album being uh, Very Heavy, Very Humble or your first album being Salisbury or, you know, maybe one of the albums like Sea of Light. Like there's so many different periods of the band where they had a different sound. So to say that something sounds like Uriah Heep um, I don't know. It just It's just not something that really works. But I will say this sounds like you're right, because there's something about the guitar sound here that I would just, if I didn't know who this was, and I just heard this say on the radio where somebody said, hey, check out this song, and they started playing it, I would immediately wonder if that was Mick, because it just has like Mick's signature all over it. Partially what he's playing, partially the octave he's playing it in, but also just the style and, and the sound. Like there's just there's just something about that that just screams Mick Box. I heard you say the change had come around. And that my wise words won the day. Just when you felt the axe was falling. Yeah, I really like the mix on this. Um, I love the feel of it for one. Like it just it just came out of the gate with a great start and then uh it didn't really lay back for the verse, but it's kind of opened up a little bit. I mean, musically it's giving a lot of room for Bernie. I can hear everything very clearly. I can hear Mick, I can hear Phil, I can hear Dave, and of course we can hear Russell because that snare and kick really cut through. Um, but I I like there's like a little, just a little double hit that we're getting from Dave on bass. That's really cool. I like that he's not doing it on every pass. I like that he's just throwing it in um, here and there so that we just get a little something different, a little something to kind of draw our attention. And uh, the bass sounds good. It's it's cutting through again on this song, which I like. And I think a lot of it too is just maybe the amount of keyboard and guitar layers have been burying the bass a little bit on some of the songs because right now, uh, like I said, it's a little more open. So there's room for the bass to cut through. So we'll see if that changes, if more layers are added throughout the song. But right here, what we've got is very clean, very clear. And uh, I, I really like where it's headed. I've said that so much. That was cool. Uh, I really like those uh, the emphasis that we're getting there, but it kind of reminded me a little bit of uh, I think it's time to live on Salisbury, just that dun, dun, except that it's not on uh, the Hammond. You know, we're getting it on guitar here, but uh, it kind of has that same feel, just that same boom. You need to hear this emphasis. And I really like that. It's so powerful when it's used well. Um, I've heard that kind of thing done before, but it's it's usually um, not in good taste. Like it's overemphasized or it's it's repeated too much or in places where it just doesn't work. And this actually works really well. I like the way that all the pieces fit together so far for this song. I mean, everything has its lane and it stays in it. 
and uh, different things get a little brighter when they need to. And everything is just nice and clear and clean. So there's another part where we're hearing Russell, instead of playing on the hi-hat or the ride, he's using a a floor tom. And I I love the sound of that. It's one of those things that, again, it's just so easy to overdo, but it's just for a small section. It sounds really good. Um, I think I'm hearing some taps on the snare in there as well to kind of uh, accent that a little bit. Uh, But definitely, you know, the snare hit um, where it's supposed to be. Uh, and then we go from that into a completely different feel. Um, it just, you know, it, it, it's the beat speeds up, uh, not tempo wise, but just as far as the way it's playing, it's now doubled. And um, that is a great trick. Like I love going from uh, the floor tom part into something that's a little faster. Uh, it's, uh, what a great transition there. Out went the monster that kept you from living and stopped you from having your say. What a powerful lyric. That is so empowering. Like that really kind of encapsulate the title of the song, doesn't it? It's uh, it's that uh, I've been suppressed for so long and now this thing is out of my way and I can take a deep breath and feel the sunshine on my face. Uh, it, that's such a cool line. I really like that. Um, musically, this is a, a really great passage. Some killer playing from Dave. Now that we can hear it um, cutting through a little bit more, um, it's still blended into the music. Like the, the bass doesn't sound very sharp. There's not a lot of high end EQ on it. So some of it's blending in. But if you listen close, you can hear uh, what he's playing. It's very much in the style of what you would expect bass to be in your eye heap, which has always been uh, adventurous and not uh, not resting on the laurels of just playing quarter or eighth notes by any means. Uh, sounds really good. A little bit jazzy with that double hit there um, that we hear uh, again, as we talked about earlier. Uh, a really cool part. Great delivery from Bernie. And um, yeah, really solid song. I'm liking the, the bits of Hammond and guitar. Again, very well balanced on this song. Um, yep. Everybody's gotta have a ghost inside of their mind. Just beware, they'll pull on your lifeline. You breeze through day to day, you might as well be sleeping while life was dry. Yeah, even even hearing it a second time, that transition is so powerful. I really like that. Um, I, I think had I not pointed it out, like if I didn't take time to talk about it and analyze that a little bit, I don't know that I would have remembered that was coming. And I think I would have been surprised by it again. Of course, now, you know, I talked about it, so I knew it was coming, but I think it still sounded great. I really like the feel of that. Uh, I don't know what we're heading into next. I feel like it might be something different, but that was a nice fill by Russell. The toms sound absolutely great on this album, on every single song. Um, maybe slightly, just slightly too loud, a hair too loud, um, but the the quality of the sound is really good. So-
I mean, I couldn't cut in anywhere because <laughs> it was all solos and cool stuff. Uh, here we're treated to really three solo parts. Uh, but I love that pre-chorus. Um, that was really powerful. I like that they did that at, uh, you know, the the uh, slower version of the beat. That was really nice. Uh, a great lead in. And then, uh, an, uh, as usual, a nice explosive Hammond solo from Phil. Uh, really felt a lot of just fierceness in that. Almost kind of representing that lyric I read earlier, like that breaking free and now I'm free and just, ah, what do I do? Um, wanting to do everything all at once. And and uh, it, it was a really great solo uh, heading into mix with the uh, back to the increase in tempo. Um, of course, that just fit perfectly. And, and I was waiting. I was just waiting for Mick to jump in when I felt that was coming. Uh, another great solo from him as well. I'm really enjoying the organ guitar solo combination on this album. There's been quite a few songs that have had it. And um, I'm not tired of it by by any means. I think that when you've got players that are this good, you could do that on nearly every song and uh, and it'll be enjoyable because they're going to be different. They're going to be unique. They're going to be passionate. And uh, that's what you really want. Um, and then, of course, uh, we end with that little uh, bass solo there. Uh, I really like that. I like the bass cutting through. You get to really hear the depth of the sound that Davey's got on this one because uh, it's not being encumbered by any other instruments other than some drums and just a little bit on the sides. But uh, the bass is really focused on that. So you can hear uh, what his tone is actually like. And um, it's always interesting when you listen to an instrument standalone or mostly standalone versus to uh, versus what it sounds like blended in with other instruments. Like you don't really hear the grit as much in the bass as you do when it's alone. And if you guys have ever listened to isolated tracks, like I, I love the concept of isolated tracks. If you're uh, especially if you're a musician, I think you can appreciate the performances a little bit more if you know everything that the person did when they were recording. A lot of times I've been surprised because of different mixes and things. I've gone back and listened to isolated tracks and went, I had no idea this person even played that. I never heard it. Um, and that's, that's the way it is. So uh, to also, but also to get to hear their tone and all the work that they put into their tone. I remember hearing um, the bass track from burn from Glenn Hughes and just being blown away at how thick and heavy the bass was when it wasn't, uh, you know, blended in with the guitar and organ. Uh, I, I was actually very shocked at, at the level of distortion on it and um, how heavy it really sounded as an isolated instrument. So, uh, and as an engineer, of course, I understand how the blending process works and all that, but it's amazing how much you lose as a standalone instrument versus the blend. So it's really nice to hear what Dave's got in his tone here. Uh, I, I really like it. I think it really works well for this album. I'm going to go out on a limb once again. And that's always precarious, but just my opinion. I'm going to say that uh, that first part in this section that we just heard was a little bit of a throwback to Traveler in Time. Uh, slowed down uh, a little bit different, but it kind of had a, a, a bit of the same feeling to it. And I really like that. Uh, I, I like it slowed down. I think it's got um, a, a different amount of power that way. And uh, that sounded really cool. I love mixed tone on this album, too. I don't know if I've really talked about that before, but I really love his sound on this album um, and the Hammond. I've said, I think, several times now how great that that sounds. Um, but I love this. I love the dynamics here. I love the the energy. I love these little uh, bass moments that we get. Uh, but uh, just the the pattern changes, the the notes that they're playing in these progressions always very interesting. And I've said this so many times throughout the history of the band as I've been going through it. They are so good at transition and they're so good at finding interesting ways of getting from point A to, from point, a to point B. Instead of just saying, well, you know, we're going to do um, C and then A and then B. Uh, that's a standard one or, or A, C, G, F, uh, you know, whatever the standard progressions might be for the, these types of songs. Instead of doing that, we're going to do something just completely unexpected and we're going to do it a lot in a lot of different ways so that you really never know what's coming. You never know what to expect 
when a song starts. You don't know where it's going to go. It's always going to be interesting to, to learn that. And uh, they are definitely the masters of that, I have to say. See what I mean? Unexpected. I really like uh, this piano and string part. Um, it's it's again unexpected, completely different. Um, feels really good. I don't know how easy or difficult it would be to play that live for Phil because he would be covering both parts. Maybe they could switch the strings to a guitar or something. Um, but I was I was thinking it would be. I, I don't know if bands have ever done that with an album that's just come out. Usually it's a throwback to an older album, like when they go and play a concert and they'll do a double set. One set will be a classic album and the other set will be all other songs, like songs that are other hits, not from that album and uh, with a couple of new songs blended in. But I feel like this album is so good that I would love to see them just come out and perform this entire album. But of course, you've got to do your Gypsy and Lady in Black and uh, Easy Living and songs like that. You have to. I mean, you just have to. So uh, you would have to do a set and a half or a double set to make that work. And I don't know of any band, like I said, that's come out and done it on their first album. I know bands like Queensryche did Operation Mindcrime, Deep Purple did Machine Head. Um, I know there's some other bands that I'm not thinking of at the moment that have done that. But uh, I know it's a possibility, but as a brand new album with with material that's not that familiar with people, I don't think that's ever been done. There's probably a reason for it. But from a an enjoyment perspective, I feel like I really want to hear every song in this album performed because I think they would all translate to the stage very, very well. So any songs that they pick, I'll be excited to experience when I get to see him live. What a patient build through that last section. I really dig that. Um, you have to enjoy what you're playing in a song for sure. But those little piano notes, I don't know why I'm using the word little so much because they're really epic to me. But uh, that's just my word today. So I keep using it. But in any case, those piano notes that we're hearing um, really kind of just make you want, okay, wow, he did that. Okay, what's he going to do on the next one? What's he going to do on the next one? And uh, then you've got the second guitar that comes in as the harmony. Um, it's a great build into an incredible fill and then back into the song again. And I, I just love that. The interesting thing was, and I don't know why I feel about it this way, but I almost feel like the fill should have ended on a crash cymbal because there's like a second of space in there that feels oddly empty. And maybe that's the point. 
you know, it's very possible, but I, I, I kind of feel like there should have been like a, a crash symbol on that snare and then one coming in on beat one of the next measure. I like that he didn't do it. I'm saying there should have been one because that's how I would have played it. That's how I would feel it. Unless there was some reason somebody said, hey, don't do a, a hit here because, you know, then obviously I wouldn't have. But I don't know. It's just it's a weird feeling for me as a drummer, because that just seems so natural that you would have hit the snare in the crash, filled in that space and then come in on the next measure on the one with another crash and kick. So, uh, yeah, very cool, though. Very interesting. Don't worry, Russell, your job is safe. How awesome is Bernie's voice here? You know, he's not doubling it. He's there's no harmony. There's no, you know, anything. It's just his voice. And it sounds absolutely fantastic. He's got so much power. He knows how to control it. I love the uprise in his tone there on a couple of those, uh, the end of the lines. But uh, man, that guy is just a powerhouse. So I love how many times I have done a first hearing review of a song on this show and I comment on something. And then when I go to continue the song, that thing I just commented on got even better. Bernie really kicked it into another gear for the end of the song. Love the layers of vocals on it. Sounded absolutely fantastic. Uh, even more powerful than I, <laughs> I was talking about before that part. Uh, absolutely love it. Love what Phil's playing. I love that the the song fades out, but it doesn't feel like there's more to it. It really does feel like an ending because it's not um, a beat that's continuing into the sunset that you want to chase and find out what else happened at the party before you got kicked out of it. Um, I love the tone of the synth there at the end, too, that faded. But uh, this is just killer playing from from everyone. I mean, Mick's got some great parts in here. Dave's got some great parts. There's a lot of really solid work from Phil, as, as in all the songs. Um, Russell, on top of his game, uh, got a couple of really good fills in in this song, but really just the part changes, you know, the the doubling the tempo, having the tempo, um, so many changes on this album in these songs, and, and I really like it. Did this song need to be eight minutes and 11 seconds? I don't, I don't know. Um, I'm not complaining about the length of it because I think thoroughly enjoyed it. And, and it, again, this felt like a four and a half, five minute song at best. It went by so fast. But at the same point, there were a lot of repeat parts. So I don't know. I, I, I would leave that to everyone's individual taste. I love that a band can do an eight and a half minute song or, or eight and a quarter minute song and keep me fully engaged and fully entertained through that whole time. I say fully engaged, even though I stopped this song, what, like 82 times to talk about how great it was. But I was engaged the whole time the music was playing and it didn't take me anything from the time I stopped it and started it again to immediately just get right back into it. Um, that's some great songwriting right there and some great performances. So kudos to Mick and Phil 
and uh, you know the guys contributing their parts. This is just another masterpiece. This one was really epic. I feel. Um, yes, you may have cut out a couple of the repeated parts, maybe uh, dropped out a chorus or a pre-chorus and a chorus. But honestly, um, I, I really don't have a problem with the song being that long. I, I think it's it's entertaining the whole way. Lots of great changes. Uh, this whole album has just really kept my interest from from the beginning through uh, the first 10 songs. We've got one more to go. Um, I, I have no reason to feel that it's going to be any different for that one. But uh, this has just been such a, a great and interesting album to listen to. Honestly, I would have to say one of their best yet. And, you know, we talk about the classic albums or what people consider the classic albums being the best because, you know, you're talking about Salisbury, uh, Demons and Wizards, uh, you know, the Magician's Birthday, whichever ones you want to pick from the early days. But part of that is because we have memories associated with those songs. They're part of our history. They're part of our growing up or experiences that we had where maybe music was our salvation of getting away from whatever our problems were or fights or, you know, just tough times and uh, maybe being afraid and you put the stereo on because you just want something to take you away from all that. Let it be like your audio Calgon for those of you who remember what Calgon was. I, I think that's a big part of why we hold those albums dear. Of course, we loved the music, which is why we listened to it in the first place and why it would have been a go-to for us. But my point is, in the nostalgia factor, part of that is just that we have such an association with them for such a good chunk of our lives. I would be curious for people who are new to Uriah Heep and who have listened to, you know, all the different albums now or uh, are, are going through the catalog if those albums stand out as much to you as they're all new and maybe like you're listening to all 25 albums for the first time or you've only known a couple songs and they're really fresh experiences, do those albums hold more weight than the rest of the catalog? Because for, for those of us that, you know, grew up with the band, they do. So there's that associative memory connection that we have to the music. There's the fact that, yeah, we loved it the first time we heard it, which is why we listened to it again and again and again. Um, I don't know how many times I've listened to the song Salisbury, but I would say there's a there's a piece of my life that uh, belongs to that song. But, you know, it's 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 interesting, um, especially because people enter their experience with the band at different stages. For some people, Sea of Light was the first album they ever heard. For other people, it will be Chaos and Color. And that will be their first impression of the band. And when they go back and listen to uh, maybe Sweet Freedom, they'll go, "Is are these the same guys? It sounds completely different. Who knows? But that's the thing is everybody's entry point is in a different spot. So in any case, great, great, epic song. Um, really continued this journey on uh, an epic level for me. Uh, absolutely love it. We'll be back tomorrow for the final song on the album. And that is called Closer to Your Dreams. Cheers. Thank you for joining me on this episode of Uriah Heap, the Magician's Podcast. If you have enjoyed this show, please consider going over to Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast outlet, leaving a rating or a review. Be sure to subscribe to make sure that you are notified when new episodes are available. Please be sure to share this podcast with your fellow Uriah Heap enthusiasts and anyone who you think would like Uriah Heap, which should be everyone. And if you are so inclined, please feel free to contribute to the Patreon account. And if you are not a Patreon subscriber, you can also pay through the PayPal link on the website listed in the show links below. I would also like to thank Uriah Heap for their very generous support of the show. And thank you guys for listening. We'll see you in the next episode. Happy days. <laughs>